Mycenaean civilization, first developed in the Argolis region of the Peloponnese, but soon spread to many of the neighboring lands. The early Mycenaean economy was primarily based on a combination of agriculture and pastoralism, centered on the cultivation of cereal crops and the keeping of livestock. When improved farming techniques increased agricultural efficiency, Mycenaean society complexified considerably, allowing for a division of labor and significant expansion. The Mycenaeans developed new industries, including, but not limited to, pottery, metalworking, shipbuilding, and trade with neighboring regions. They excelled at the smithing of bronze and other metals, crafting works of art, and forging various tools and weapons of war with which to combat their enemies. One of the most famous artifacts of the period is the so-called Mask of Agamemnon, a gold burial mask dating to the 16th century BCE. Although the Greek climate was generally favorable, much of the land was rugged and mountainous, and fertile farmland was limited. Competition over farmland and mineral resources fostered conflict between neighboring groups and the city-states that later emerged. Chieftains warred with each other constantly, and while pitched battles were rare, warfare often involved the destruction of enemy agriculture and the theft of enemy cattle, attacks designed to cripple the ability of the enemy to obtain food. Crops were burned, olive trees were felled, and livestock were stolen or slain on the spot. As a result, settlements tended to shift from locations near farmland, to hilltop citadels, or Acropolion, as the Greeks called them, that were more readily defensible. Mycenaean societies coalesced around these fortified settlements. The common people were ruled by a warrior elite, often with a king at the head, known in the local language as a wanax. Funerary practices complexified around this time, and much of the archaeological evidence of Mycenaean culture available to historians is found in burial sites. Although conflict was common, city-states tended to show preference towards building diplomatic relationships and economic connections with their neighbors, and later expanding those overseas. Mycenaean artifacts have been discovered in numerous coastal locations around the Aegean Sea, and even as far away as Cyprus, Egypt, and the Phoenician homeland in the eastern Mediterranean. As the Mycenaeans gradually became more established in the region, their settlements and lifestyle grew increasingly complex. One particularly notable development was the construction of palace complexes, known in the local language as Megaron. From within these, the Wanax of each growing city-state watched their realm carefully. As territorial borders expanded, aspirations did as well, and city-states found themselves locked in deadly conflicts over farmland, mineral resources, lumber sources, and trade routes. The most notable of these city-states was located at Mycenae, where 19th-century excavations unearthed large fortifications, a sophisticated palace complex and priceless treasures, many lying in burial mounds. Other significant centers of power included Tiryns, Argos, Pylos, and Menelaean, near the modern city of Sparta. Despite the volatile and variable political situation, the Mycenaean people who were spread across Attica, Boeotia, and the Peloponnese, had a considerable amount in common. They shared an early form of the Greek language, polytheistic religious systems, and common cultural norms. The Mycenaeans were almost certainly extremely warlike, as shown by numerous fortifications, and art glamorizing warfare, such as ceramic artwork, wall frescoes, carvings, and funerary objects. The palace complexes on the Acropolis of a town served as both government and military centers. The king and the nobility ruled from a position of strength, and soldiers could be drilled nearby and outfitted with weaponry from the armory. In times of war, the Acropolis was a secure place to take refuge from invaders, and the surplus food stored in the local granary could sustain a citadel under attack until the siege was broken or abandoned. It was often more prudent to destroy a city-state's economic wealth, farmland, crops, pastures, mineral deposits, port, and trade routes. The Mycenaean city-states gradually formed alliances and trading agreements however, and often displayed a loose sort of solidarity when facing outsiders.
The Minoan culture formed a robust presence on the island of Crete and the surrounding seas for over two millennia, lasting roughly from 3600 BCE to 1420 BCE. The causes of its decline are not entirely clear, although the catastrophic eruption of Thera, which devastated much of the eastern Mediterranean, stands out as a likely culprit. The damage that the eruption and its aftermath caused to Minoan Crete, and many of their trading partners, probably hamstrung their economy, which was dependent on the commercial import and export of goods. Minoan Crete was marked by numerous impressive institutions and advancements, particularly in the spheres of seafaring and writing. The Minoans were adept at navigating the Mediterranean, making contact and trading with many neighboring cultures across the sea. This legacy was represented in their art, particularly through the stunning frescoes of watercraft, fishermen, and sea life that adorn their artifacts. Their economy was predicated on trade and domination of the nearby sea routes, not on agriculture as was primarily the case in neighboring regions. Their settlements and palaces were relatively minimally fortified, demonstrating a reliance on their naval forces to stave off invasions. Through contact with eastern cultures in Egypt, Lebanon, and Canaan, the Minoans acquired not only wealth, but also various technological and intellectual advancements. Such monumental success inevitably drew the attention of their neighbors. Sometime between the late 15th and early 14th centuries BCE, the Minoan palace centers were overrun by Mycenaean invaders. It is probable that the Mycenaeans observed the declining trend of Minoan civilization in the period following the natural disasters that befell the region, and determined that the time was right to strike decisively, and eliminate a rival. Despite its rich narrative and spectacular level of detail, the Homeric Iliad, and its tale of the Trojan War, was widely considered to be fictitious, until the archaeological discoveries of Heinrich Schliemann in the 19th century. Schliemann made a fantastic set of discoveries at a dig site near Hisalik, in the northwest region of modern-day Turkey. The archaeological site was situated upon the lucrative trade route, leading from the Aegean through the Bosphorus to the Black Sea, providing a plausible incentive for the historical conflict. As time went on, numerous levels of the city were unearthed. One location corresponds remarkably well to the dates of the Trojan War, given by several classical historians and chroniclers. Additionally, analysis of its destruction layer yielded remnants of weapons of war, and evidence that the city was obliterated by fire, aligning with ancient and classical accounts of the conclusion of the conflict. Cross-examination of Hittite texts, with the archaeological evidence, linked Troy, or Ilium, with a great city called Wailusa by the Hittites, which was destroyed by invaders from the west, known to them as Ahiyawa, or home as Achaeans. According to the Homeric narrative, and several classical myths and tales that grew from it, the conflict was caused by the abduction of Helen of Sparta by Paris, a prince of Troy, with the help of the goddess Aphrodite. After much difficulty, the Mycenaeans, referred to in the epic as Achaeans, Danans, and Argives, crossed the Aegean into Asia Minor and laid siege to the city for ten long years. As the fighting wore on, claiming heroic warriors from both sides, the morale of the Mycenaeans dwindled. Finally, the cunning Odysseus devised a perilous plan to break the stalemate. Constructing a giant wooden horse containing a band of brave warriors, the Mycenaeans then sailed away, hiding their fleet behind the nearby island of Tenedos. The Trojans, desiring not to offend the gods, brought the horse inside the city, allowing the hidden warriors to open the gates in the dark of night. The Mycenaean army stormed in and laid waste to the city, killing most of its population and carrying off its fabled wealth. The Homeric epics, likely the most famous works in the history of Western literature, assured that the memory of the conflict would live on, etched eternally into the pages of history. In the centuries following the Trojan War, Mycenaean society experienced a swift decline. The exact causes are unknown, although common hypotheses have involved massive Dorian invasions, or infighting among the various Mycenaean city-states. 
Archaeological evidence and tablets bearing inscriptions in Linear B, an early form of Greek, point to clear episodes of warfare and wholesale destruction of numerous Mycenaean urban centers. This catastrophe ushered in a period of political chaos and uncertainty commonly termed the Greek Dark Ages. Notably, the city-state of Athens survived this turmoil relatively intact, perhaps due to the defensible nature of its impressive Acropolis. Seizing the opportunity to fill the power vacuum presented by the fall of the Mycenaean civilization, Athens consolidated its control over Attica, Euboea, and eastern Boeotia. The proximity of Attica to the Aegean Sea made it an ideal regional nucleus for a major trading power, and the Athenian population grew quickly. Before long, the Athenians were mounting expeditions to establish settlements on various coastal regions throughout the Aegean. Over the subsequent centuries, Athens evolved into a major naval power, establishing a thalassocracy, or maritime empire, that controlled much of the territory surrounding the Aegean, dominating the trade economy of the region. From that center of power, the Athenians engaged in trade with numerous city-states in the eastern Mediterranean as well as the Greek settlements in Sicily and southern Italy, a region later termed by the Romans as Magna Graecia, or Great Greece. During this time, intellectual and technological pursuits flourished throughout the Aegean. The Athenians went on to develop the first system of direct democracy in the late 6th century BCE, as well as a unique form of exile known as ostracism. Each citizen cast a vote, etched into a shard of pottery, known as ostracon, for a person they wished to exile. If any single person received more than 6,000 votes, they were forced to leave the city-state for 10 years. By the 5th century BCE, the region of Hellas, as the Greeks called modern-day Greece, was dominated by a number of several powerful city-states, such as Athens, Sparta, Thebes, and Corinth. These city-states tended to compete with each other economically, militarily, and culturally, but were briefly galvanized by a pair of dangerous invasions conducted by the Achaemenid Empire. This period was termed as the Persian Wars, and yielded some of the most popular narratives to come out of the classical era, such as the heroic but doomed defense of the coastal passage of Thermopylae, by King Leonidas of Sparta, and his 300 warriors. In the wake of the victory over the Persians, the Greek city-states flourished and expanded their influence further than ever before. Two city-states arose to prominence during this time. Athens was the leader of the powerful Delian League, a thalassocracy of city-states and territories that encompassed much of the Aegean Sea, dominating the economic climate of the region and boasting quite possibly the most powerful navy in the Mediterranean seen to date. Sparta, on the other hand, headed the fearsome Peloponnesian League, a formidable land-based power built on a slave economy and rigorous military training. Although the focus of each alliance was largely different, the tension between them began to increase as time went on. By 431 BCE, a Theban Spartan attack on Plataea, an Athenian ally, had drawn the Delian and Peloponnesian leagues into a deadly war that would last nearly 30 years. Thucydides' vivid account of the events of the entire Peloponnesian War demonstrates considerable early success on the part of the Athenian navy, a success that was nevertheless tempered by the effects of a devastating plague that ravaged Attica, killing roughly half of its population. The conflict carried on for years with relatively equal victories and defeats seen by both sides, but the balance was tipped by the folly of the disastrous Sicilian expedition of 415 to 413 BCE, which cost Athens 100 triremes, 30,000 oarsmen, and virtually a generation of citizen soldiers. Their military power was crippled considerably. Although Athens attempted to recover over the next several years, the Spartans were able to push into Attica, while simultaneously defeating the Athenian navy at Egospotami in 405 BCE. Its naval supply cut, the city of Athens had no choice but to surrender to the besieging Spartans, who humbled the once great power and ended the war. Internal difficulties plagued the Peloponnesian League however, and democracy was soon restored in Athens.
Following the end of the Peloponnesian War after 405 BC, many experienced Greek soldiers were out of work. Greek hoplites of the time were the greatest infantry soldiers in the West. Some found employment overseas as mercenaries. In 401 BCE, Cyrus the Younger sought to overthrow his brother, Artaxerxes II, and claim the throne of Persia. The core of his army was 10,000 Greek mercenaries, mainly hoplite infantry. The Greek contingent was told originally that they were on a punitive expedition into Southeast Asia Minor. When Cyrus continued to march on toward Babylon, the mercenaries did not object to the prospect of further riches and plunder. North of Babylon, the Persian army made a stand at Cunaxa. Although the Greek contingent won the battle, Cyrus was killed, and the invasion came to an immediate end. The Persians offered a truce to negotiate with the Greek mercenary commanders, but killed them treacherously instead. The Greeks chose new commanders and began the long trek homeward, up the Tigris River and over mountains, toward Greek colonies on the Black Sea. The Persians harassed them but did not attempt an engagement with their main army. The king was content just to see them go. In the decades following the return of Xenophon to Hellas in 399 BCE, the various city-states continued their internecine struggle for supremacy. The powerful Spartans were brought low at Leuctra in 371 BCE by Thebes, who briefly enjoyed their dominant position before being challenged by an Athenian-Spartan alliance at Mantinea in 362 BCE. The regional balance of power remained in a peaceful status quo for a time, but near perpetual warfare had weakened the city-states considerably. A new power rose to the north, in Macedonia, to fill this vacuum. King Philip of Macedon made substantial strides in the development of Hellenistic battle strategy and tactics, combining the traditional core of heavy infantry and light skirmishing troops, as well as potent cavalry forces. The Macedonian phalanx, surrounded by a core of peltastes, hypaspists, slingers, prodromoi, and elite companion cavalry, soon claimed mastery over most of Hellas. Following his assassination in 336 BCE, Philip was succeeded as king of Macedon by his son Alexander, who would later be known as the Great, and widely regarded as one of history's most capable tacticians and charismatic commanders. After a brief series of campaigns in which he crushed local revolts and strengthened his control of Hellas, Alexander's army crossed the Dardanelles and pushed into the great Achaemenid Persian Empire, winning a decisive victory at the Battle of the Granicus River in 334 BCE. The Persians were utterly stunned by the young leader. After the victory at Issus, in 334 BCE, he conducted the famous Siege of Tyre, a siege that involved the construction of a massive causeway allowing the Macedonians to seize the island city. A series of victories followed, most prominently in Gorgomela in 331 BCE. Soon all of Persia was beneath his heel. This series of conquests ushered in an age of prosperity, marked by the flow of Hellenistic ideas into Alexander's new dominions, and vice versa, creating a legacy that would last for centuries.